Much better. Okay. Genre, I guess, and John is going to take us to the Canadian Maritimes. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as I do this, I remember that it says 2000. That's almost a quarter of a century ago. <laughs> and so a lot of things have changed since then. And, uh, and uh, if, uh, if those of you who have been in that area or who have experience with that would like to add or update me, that'd be wonderful. So from September 28th to October 8th, 2000, I had the marvelous opportunity of visiting the Canadian Maritime Provinces. The trip was created as an individualized familiarization trip combined with vacation for Joanne and I. AAA Washington and Tourism Canada sponsored this trip to enhance my status as a, quote, Canadian specialist. Um, remember, these reports that I've done were prepared for uh, AAA employees, so I, I talk a lot about the, the restaurants and the hotels and the sites that we saw. Um, and I'll maybe skip over some of those. Anyway, we flew on Continental through Houston and, and picked up our car, Ford Focus. Um, anyway, we, uh, at that time, the Ford Focus was a new international car. Now, of course, it's different, so I didn't get one of those. I got a Mits Mitsubishi Mirage, and it was okay, but it was, had a bad turning radius, and it was, but it was okay for some of the smaller twisty roads. Um, we started in Boston, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that because I have relatives and we did a few things there. Um, navigating in Boston at night was not as bad as I expected. Fortunately, the traffic was light, signage was clear, and I had good directions. At that time, the big dig was underway to connect Logan Airport with the Ted Williams Tunnel to I-90. That since has become a welcome development because during that time they often talked about the big mess. Um, let's see. So this was Thursday and Friday, 28th and 29th of September. Now the first two days was, of the trip were spent with relatives in Boston. Having been there previously and wanting to avoid tourists for a couple of days, we didn't visit the usual spots in Boston. Instead, chose two lesser known attractions in the Brookline and Jamaica Plain areas just west of downtown Boston. While Jamaica Plain is actually within the city, Brookline was one of the earliest planned <coughs> suburbs. One day we visited the Museum of Transportation in Lars Anderson Park, overlooking Boston and located in a historic castle-like carriage house. This is a perfect site for many summer car shows, and its collections, its collections include a variety of electric, steam, and gas-powered vehicles. Featured were some of the most unique cars in the, of the century. We began another day by walking around Jamaica Pond, half the size of Seattle's Green Lake, but a very pleasant one as well. Um, a natural pond, it was a very popular boating and swimming and ice skating site for Bostonians in the early 1900s. At one time, it was even used for the commercial production of ice. Later in the day, we visited the original design center <clears throat> for the pond and the emerald necklace of parks that adjoin the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. Um, you know, the emerald necklace starts really at, at the Charles River with Fenway Park and comes all the way south, and that's the emerald necklace. Olmsted and his associate were responsible for the landscaping design that combines nature and buildings in harmony. Their designs, of course, include New York Central Park, the Washington, D.C. Capitol Ground, Volunteer Park in Seattle, and many others. The calming effect of his creations and the desire to share this experience with all classes of people are only part of a very interesting story. So, this was Saturday, the 30th. This day began, this is the first route, which is from Boston, heading up north to our uh, destination of Belfast, Maine. The day began on the freeway with several toll stops, and sites and stops included Kittery Coffee and a Cinnamon Roll in York, with its broad sandy beach and our first look at the Atlantic. Drives through a very crowded Kenny Bunkport, Biddleford, and Sacco. 
<laughs> this took us into Portland where we walked a bit and had lunch at Gritty McDuff's, Maine's original brew pub. Our next side trip was the, to the sea was Booth Bay Harbor where we walked and coffee in the next sun, in the, in the windy sun. We arrived in Belfast about 5 p.m. This could have been a shorter drive, but we chose to sample the coastal villages, which we would not see on the return trip. These towns are small, quaint, and much the same after a while. No offense, Judy. <laughs> um, Man, the many harbors and bays that poke into the shore like little fingers create wonderful settings. Belfast for us was a great find. It's not heralded in the tour book, but possesses a large number of late 1800 solid brick structures that wind down the main street from the city hall to the harbor. Lots of tourist shops, of course, but many are active businesses frequented by locals. The spirit of this town was seen in the several no Walmart signs we saw. Several life-size decorated bears surprised us along the street. The Belfast Bear Fest was held this summer. The bears are actually produced as targets for hunters, but are decorated by artists and sponsored by local businesses. Forty-three bears in all sorts of costumes and decor hang from buildings, climb telephone poles, lounge in shop windows, and greet you from corner vantage points. On October 22nd, the bears were auctioned off with proceeds going to the sponsor's favorite charities. This was, uh, you may remember in Seattle, they had decorated pigs. Yeah. Uh, it was a, I forget <coughs> the pig's name in Pike Place, it's a petunia or something. Rachel. Anyway, huh? Rachel. Rachel? Okay. Anyway, this was kind of an inspiration for the pigs in Seattle. <laughs> so we woke up to a bit of fog the next day and left Belfast. The leaves appeared a bit brighter. Our primary side trip <coughs> was to Acadia National Park. Before, stop, before driving in the park, we stopped at Bahaba. This was the summer home of several wealthy families, including Rockefeller, Post Pulitzer, and Morgan. However, many of the original homes were destroyed by fire. There were two large cruise ships at anchor, ferrying passengers to and from land. We enjoyed walking the two-mile public path along the shore as it winds in front of some beautiful properties. Bar Harbor's proximity to the park and the water make it extremely popular. One can drive around the outside of Acadia on either of two loop routes without entering the park itself. Or to really see the park, take the official one-way loop route within the park around Mount Desert Island. I should stop here. We had never been to Maine before, so we had to take advantage of this on our way north, but we'll get there. As with many sites on this trip, ours was a quick view of some beautiful ocean scenery and round outcroppings that are highly unusual for this area. Northwesterners may not understand why Acadia, like the Great Smokies, is so popular. These sites are not as majestic as the Rockies or Yosemite, but they are convenient for large urban eastern areas. We stopped at Lubeck for lunch to try lobster rolls, cold lobster trunks, chunks, crab or scallops will work too, wrapped in a bun like a hot dog but with mayonnaise sauce. Fish cakes or crab cakes are more to my liking. The apple pie was okay. We had hoped to use the route across Campobello Island and Deer Island into New Brunswick mainland, but the ferries stop on Labor Day. But we did make our visit to Campobello, where Roosevelt 46-room cottage was very interesting. This barn-like structure is nicely maintained in its original state with many of the family's personal belongings. One can easily see why this site, now a Canadian national park, became so popular for the Roosevelts. We returned to the U.S. and sought out the easternmost point of U.S., the lighthouse at West Quaddy Point, for a quick photo opportunity. <coughs> We proceeded north and entered Canada for the second time today at Calais and crossed into St. Stephen's, New Brunswick. We then drove through St. John, the oldest incorporated city in Canada, now a busy seaport and ferry terminal from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. At dusk, we arrived at St. Martin's, a quaint town of 400 
and found the St. Martin's Country Inn. This place is a Victorian oasis, circa 1857, in the middle of nowhere overlooking the Bay of Fundy. Myrna, the owner, has had this place for several years and is thinking of retiring. <coughs> However, her love of the place and desire to have the right buyers keeps her there. We lost another hour by entering the Atlantic time zone and enjoyed soul wrapped around a lobster stuffing for dinner. Yum. Mm -hmm. We do talk a lot about the food because, of course, that's part of the joy of a trip. After breakfast, at the end with a couple from New Orleans, we visited the Fundy Trail. Now we're, let's see, this is, yeah, the Fundy Trail. Um, a multi-use development with low-speed roadway, pedestrian bicycle trail, and many footpaths. From there, we drove on the beautiful route from St. Martin's to Sussex. This is a winding road with fall colors, evergreens, and green rolling hills, pastures, farmhouses, and cemeteries with tilting old tombstones bordering the road. After that, our plans fell apart. Could I be tired from two days of driving and lots of late night eating and drinking? Anyway, from Sussex, we sought a back road to Fundy National Park to continue enjoying the coastal beauty of New Brunswick. However, the road got narrower and turned to gravel. Oops. Then we met Malcolm, a retiree with two golden retrievers on a small farm. He must not get much company because he talked for some time while giving us directions to the main road. Thus, we were way behind and decided to pass on Fundy National Park and the Hopewell Caves, where the tidal action is seen so dramatically. More on this incredible body of water later. Our second disappointment came when we tried to visit the Acadian Museum at the University of Moncton. The sign said closed for the season. So we walked around Moncton a bit and headed for Prince Edward Island. Oh, I didn't make a picture. There's a Confederation Bridge. I didn't make, take a picture of it, or maybe I have it later. Connecting New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island is long. This 13-kilometer, eight-mile, two-lane bridge spans the North Cumberland Strait and is quite an engineering feat. Passengers in low-slung vehicles may have difficulty viewing the scenery. We did. The view from a bus would be great. Having missed one Acadian museum, we chose another, this time in Miskouche, that primarily features the lives of the Acadians on the island. A short video on display and descriptions of their early life were very informative. This experience piqued our interest in the history of those early French settlers. Our day of disappointments was overcome by the next drive, a short one, to Cavendish. The island is flat with farmlands, tidy white houses, low rolling hills, salt water, never far away from salt water, never far away, small white churches with black trim, and so, so clean in appearance. Did you know that PEI, Prince Edward, Island was the last province to join Canada before Newfoundland and Nunavut, Nunavut, excuse my pronunciation. This is extremely rich farmland. Seafood is plentiful. The settlers, settlers and owners of this property were able to live a very full life without outside help. For this reason, and the British and other latecomers were very jealous of the islanders. This and the fact that Acadians would not pledge alliance like allegiance to the British crown led to their deportation in 1755. We'll get there. We stayed at a place called the Kindred Spirits Country Inn and Cottages. Uh, it lies just off of one of the major intersections in Cavendish. Remember, this is Anne of Green Gables country, and the inn was immediately adjacent to Anne's famous albeit albeit fictional cottage. Ours was not a desire to experience the popularity of Anne and the multitude of attractions related to her on the island. However, it is impossible not to feel the environment in which the stories were written. Kindred Spirits was a very relaxing place with lots of wicker furniture, broad porches, and informal recreational areas. Uh, from this recently built Victorian-style inn, we got a um, a nice view of the, uh, 
Oh, and you wouldn't get fresh chocolate chip cookies and tea at 9 p.m. while you discuss the day's adventures. <clears throat> the cookies were good. At, at dusk, we drove about 16 kilometers through a small village along the northern coastal past Prince Edward Island National Park to have our first lobster at Dalve by the sea. Let's see if we've got that. Oh, there's the Confederation Bridge. I remember one story about this. They, they built a fire on the bridge at one time to keep, was that during the COVID? I think during COVID when they tried to keep um, people limited from getting there. I'll have to look that up and tell you something. Oh, here we go. So we went by Prince Edward uh, Island National Park. Now this Dalve by the Sea is an elegant Victorian summer home built by Alexander MacDonald, one time president of Standard Oil. It is probably the nicest, if not only, seashore resort located on Prince Edward Island National Park property. <laughs> like many old park inns, this place went through many owners before the present operating agreement with the park department. It features luxurious rooms, services, and amenities. I was a dis bit disappointed with the lobster, but the service and ambience were unsurpassed. Prince Edward Island closes for the season under a blanket of snow. Its residents take time to rejuvenate their spirits as they get reacquainted with family, neighbor, and friends. If I ever go back, this is a great place to relax. Next time I rent a bicycle, and spend at least a week touring the, at a leisurely pace. <clears throat> Thursday, this is the 3rd of October. Um, it was sadly fitting that on this day Pierre Trudeau's funeral was held. We listened to the tributes on the radio. The Maritimers with whom we spoke, unlike many in Quebec, were hopeful this his memory will strengthen the United Canada. Remember around that time, Quebec, um, and at least one of the provinces, if not two, were trying to break off being French. And I remember uh, those in Calgary in the West said, let them go. We're fine here in the West with our Canada. They can be French if they want. Anyway, they were hopeful that his memory at the time would strengthen the United Canada. Uh, fresh blueberry muffins waited outside our door this morning. We enjoyed them even more breakfast at the Kindred Spirits before the half hour drive to Charlestown. Our 9 a.m. destination <coughs> was the Province House National Historic Site, the site of which led to Canada's Confederation in 1857. Upon entering this national memorial, we felt very smug as the only visitors with three staff and a gift shop attendant greeting us. Surprise! <clears throat> the next moment, the auditorium doors opened and a busload of tourists swarmed out in front of the small rooms of the building. Shortly thereafter, we watched the same video they had seen. It was excellent having been filmed on site using actors in period costume. The provincial legislature, at least at the time, 26 conservatives and one liberal, still meets in this building. We strolled the streets around the province house, stepped into St. Dustin's Basilica, and enjoyed the narrow streets and clapboard architecture in the center of old Charlestown. <clears throat> By now we knew a little about the Acadians and Longfellow's poem Evangeline, but wanted to learn more. So we browsed through a few bookstores in Charlestown invited Evangeline to join us on our travels, drove for an hour to the Woods Island Ferry. The one and a half hour Woods Island Caribou Ferry ride was smooth. We sat on the deck most of the time enjoying the balmy but overcast day and talked with a woman from Texas who was on a group tour of the Maritimes. As with several other bus tours at this time of the year, the itinerary was similar to ours, although a bit more relaxed. Again, as I've said, so much of that area closes down in the winter. <clears throat> Shortly after landing in Nova Scotia, um, the rain began and pelted us most of the way to Sydney. We arrived at a place called Paradise Found Bed and Breakfast. 
This is the place we found that was not on the... Not got it here? No. That's the next day. Anyway, the Paradise Found Bed and Breakfast was a wonderful time with a retired Navy guy who, who ran it. Uh, the people were incredibly kind and... Um, what do we... They turned out to be very hospitable. When we asked for dinner recommendations, Connie said, we have a few leftovers if you don't mind. We declined faintly and enjoyed crab cakes, salad, bread, and wine and dessert. Um, he's a retired naval attaché from the U.S. and had many stories to tell us. His job really became more social than military, um, so that was a perfect transition to this business. Um, let's see, they bought this house and moved into the Sydney neighborhood. She's originally from Sydney, he was from Victoria. He indicated that Nova Scotia had, a, at the time, a 14% unemployment rate. Well, Newfoundland's is 26%. Sydney lost two major employers, a coal mine and a steel mill, and while a call center operation moved in recently, the impact is minimal. We finished the wine as Rick was boiling more crab for leftover and retired to watch the presidential debate at the time. I won't tell you how much we paid for the room. Anyway, next. This is Wednesday, October 4th, from Sydney to Lips Liscombe Mills. Bell and Baldwin built a boat. <coughs> Our breakfast at the Paradise Inn was a French toast sandwich, or more about food. Anyway, they gave us some goodies to go along the way, so. A brief drive through Sydney made us want to stay longer, but the schedule calls. The Cabot Trail is probably the most scenic drive on the Cape Breton Island. Unfortunately, we had to settle for the other scenery and headed to the Lewisburg Fortress. We were in line with two bus groups, two tour bus groups, before the fortress opened. The 10 minute bus ride to the fortress offers incredible view with the old buildings and waves of Atlantic pounding on the shore. Established in 1713 by the French, it changed hands several times before the British eventually destroyed it. Now approximately one-fifth restored, this has been an amazing reconstruction to authenticity. Only a few of the sites were operating this day. We spoke with a guard in one of the towers, the baker, a hot hotelier, and two boatsmen at the dock. These folks are in period costume and perform their duties as if it was 1744. About a hundred people are employed year-round with up to 200 in the summer. Of the reenactment sites around the country, this has to be one of, if not the best. We drove back past Sydney and headed for Bedeck, home of Alexander Graham Bell. Let's see if I have... I'll just have to talk about this one. This National Historic Site includes a wonderful museum based on his tetrahedron design. His telephone invention was only the beginning and provided him with the wealth to tinker the rest of his life. Two inventions, among others, surprised me. The first hyperfoil, which he built with his partner, Casey Baldwin, is replicated in full size and a telephone that transmitted sound on the sun's rays. The Bell home sits on a home with a commanding view of the Bras d'Or Lake, which is still occupied by his descendants. We ended our day in Bedeck with a tasty bunch of crab cakes and seafood chowder on the sunny deck of the Linwood uh, Inn. Uh, Cape Breton Island in the northern part of Nova Scotia is actually two lakes. Two narrow channels divide the island and connect with Bras d'Or Lake. The lake is actually salt water, but about 20% less saline than the surrounding Atlantic Ocean. Next time I'll drive the Cabot Trail to get the full impact of this beautiful area. But we had to choose the fortress. Let's see if I'm... I'm going ahead too far here. <coughs> so, our afternoon drive from Bedeck through An Antogonish and south on Highway 7 past Sherbrooke gave us more beautiful scenery and colors. The Sherbrooke Village is another reenactment site in this old lumbering and mining town. It's a popular destination for travelers from Halifax, driving along the Atlantic Ocean with rivers and lakes nearby, amazing cloud formation, and turning foliage gave us a wonderful end to the day.
We ended up at the Lipscomb Lodge and Conference Center, another oasis. <coughs> it's a full resort with tennis courts, hiking trails, canoeing, fishing, etc. We were directed to our cozy, woodsy, rustic chalet overlooking the river with enviable view from its deck. <coughs> um, the bottle of wine and fruit cracker cheese basket was also a nice surprise. I didn't ask whether this was a special for us or included for other guests. Anyway, it was a wonderful place to have an evening. We heard folks singing old songs around a piano as we headed towards the dining room and stopped to one young, watch a young man cooking our plank salmon against an open fire. The hard wood against which it creates the taste for which it is named. Our dinner was very good and enhanced by conversation with the pianist we heard earlier. Families come here in the summer, senior groups on tour buses come in the fall. Next day, we went from Lipscomb Mills <coughs> to Wolfville. Deportation and Immigration. Our two hour drive along the Atlantic Ocean to Halifax showed us why this tour is a tour bus destination. <coughs> the sparsely populated area still has the beauty one expects of Nova Scotia's sheltered bay and their coastal towns without the fluff of more popular sites such as Peggy's Cove and Mahone Bay. As we headed across the bridge into Halifax from its smaller neighbor Dartmouth, we encountered a toll booth, of course. I ended up in the token building and had none. Halifax is the largest city we've been in since Boston. We've been away from the hustle of city life, so I threw a bunch of change in the bin, hoping for the best. No luck. Joanne tried to hop out to get tokens from the next booth, but got her foot caught in the travel bag strap. I was waving a bill in the air so the folks behind me wouldn't get too upset. Finally, a guy behind me got out of his car and dropped a token in the bin. Thanks for more hospitality. A university town and Bohemian town, and now a major cruise ship stop and destination city for the Maritimes, Halifax has much to see. We chose two sites which speak to the city's history. Um, and I wanted to go to Halifax particularly because it's the, the main center in the area but also it was the, one, the port through which my father came from the old country. Our first destination was Pier 21, to which we walked two miles along the city's boardwalk while observing many buildings under construction. This restored warehouse, now the Canadian Museum of Immigration, was Canada's Ellis Island from 1939 to 1962. Canada had very liberal immigration policies during this time to help build their new country. Then abandoned, it has been restored as a museum and a cruise terminal. The museum is wonderful and very realistic. From small loudspeakers under the benches, you hear babies cry and mothers consoling them, calls from immigration authorities, and conversations in many languages. You can stand on a rumbling floor with train sounds and watch the scenery go by, as did immigrants before. It was really recreated the feeling of a train going across Canada. Or you can sit in a cubicle and watch videos of immigrants telling their stories. Halifax became a major military port during World War II. As we walked through the old part of Halifax looking for St. Paul's Anglican Church, the oldest Protestant place of worship in Canada. Did I have a picture of that? Yeah, St. Paul's Anglican Church. <coughs> Erected in 1722, this is still one of the most active parishes in Nova Scotia. The rector, John Newton, greeted us, a native of Victoria, and told us a bit about the church. We lunched at a diner in the old Keith Brewery, now a complex of retail and commercial space near the waterfront. On to another Acadian site, Grand Prix. <coughs> Now a National Historic Site, this is where Lieutenant Colonel John Winslow gave his famous order that all Acadians' personal goods are forfeited to the Crown, and that they and their families are to be deported as soon as the ships arrive to take them away. Although the Acadians had lived peacefully for several generations, they were considered a threat to the Crown, as they would not sign an allegiance. The history of the Acadians was little known 
little known until Henry Wadsworth Longfellow immortalized the spirit of this history in his famous poem, Evangeline. Evangeline was separated from her betrothed and spent her remaining years searching for him. More than a fictional character, Evangeline symbolizes the perseverance of the Acadian people. Here, a statue stands before a small church reconstructed in what was to believe to be the original form. The young guide with whom we spoke is from Quebec and shared his observation about Quebec nationalism and the importance of a cultural identity. <clears throat> we ended the day at the Bloomington Inn, a three diamond property in Wolfville. These are great old properties that we stayed in and, and purposely we tried to find them that had more of a history of the area rather than just a place to stay. Wolfville is an excellent location from which to visit many historical sites in Nova Scotia. The owner took some time with us talking about the area and the family's work. This inn is a center for tourists and they have elder hostel programs each year featuring topics such as lobster, imagine, lobster geology, Evangeline and the Tides of Fundy. Um, let's see, a little more about them. Apparently Wolfville has a microclimate which helps the increasing tourism business. He told us something that I never thought about, that Victoria is the most British city in Canada. Bloomington is a very heavy Victorian dark wood floral wallpaper in reds and greens and classy silver service. Food was excellent. Next day. Uh, after a heavy breakfast in the heavy room, we began an easy but very rainy drive along the east coast of the Bay of Fundy to Digby. We passed on a couple of Acadian sites because of time and the weather constraints and chose the Annapolis Tidal Generating Station, our morning tourist stop. The Bay of Fundy has the highest tides in the world, up to 50 feet. This is not only due to its narrow configuration, but also to the reverse tidal action from the south. One person described it as if you were making small waves in the bathtub, which then are magnified by the water coming off the other side of the tub. I'll try this in my next bath. <clears throat> this spot, a small island in the Annapolis River, was chosen as an experimental site to harness the tidal action. Built in 1980, it houses a huge four-blade turbine, or runner, which is activated when the tide recedes. The station generates more than 30 million kilowatt hours per year, enough electricity to power 45 homes. This is the first and largest structure in the world at the time. Several other sites in the bay were being considered. However, the utility said the decision to permanently retire the 30-year-old station was due to a failure of the crucial component in the generator and authorization required by the Department of Fisheries Ocean after it determined the facility caused serious harms to fish. Sound familiar? But like our hydroelectric places? I thought it was wonderful, and I think there's more power that could get from tidal action in the seas, but no longer. Anyway, our next adventure was on the trip, and the trip was the MV Princess of Acadia from Digby to St. John, New Brunswick. Unlike our previous ferry ride, the seas were rougher and the distance farther. <clears throat> we watched a movie for part of the time and ate fish and chips while experiencing the rolling action of the bay. <coughs> Have you ever heard of poutine? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a concoction of French fries covered with melted cheese and heavy gravy. A man next to us was topping his off with tons of ketchup and a side order of deep fried onions as our plates were sliding back and forth on the table. <laughs> the staff on board said, this is nothing. Easy for them to say. <laughs> the seas calmed as we reached St. John, but we immediately lost our way while taking in a bit of the town scenery. So we asked for directions and left the rain and traffic and headed to St. Andrews. Let's see if I've got this. <coughs> the drive on Highway 1 and 27 were <coughs> pretty. The rain and clouds masked the colors, which were really beginning to show now. Another quaint seaport, St. Andrews has an interesting story. In, 18, in 1783, following the American Revolution, 
United Empire Loyalists dismantled their clapboard homes in Castine, Maine, and reassembled 250 of them in St. Andrews. <coughs> St. Andrews to Exeter, New Hampshire. Overcast 324 miles the day of colors. On Pasquati, Pasquati, I love the sound of this, Bay in St. Andrews became famous for the Algonquin Hotel. I think it should be. One of the famous Canadian Pacific structures, this was originally built in 1898. The original wooden structure was leveled by fire in 1914 and rebuilt in 1915. This place has real class, on par with Bam Springs, Chateau Lake Louise, and Frontenac, and Empress. Its grounds are impeccable. You may know that there were about 15 or 20 Canadian Pacific hotels built along the, along the, the, the route. Originally, when the train stopped, it was just somebody handing you sandwiches or things to eat on the side. But slowly, as these locations grew, then those hotels were built. Wonderful places. The grounds at this place were impeccable. Services and recreational opportunities are abundant. We even were given an upgrade to a beautiful king bed mini suite in the newer wing of the complex. Initially disappointed as I looked out our window at the old structure and then over the grounds into the bay, <coughs> any reservations disappeared. Seven tour groups were on the grounds during, uh, along with a large party, etc. Cetera, et cetera, we could talk more about this. Um, we wandered through the various lobbies and ended up in the basement pub. And, um, we enjoyed a beer sampler as a couple from Portland, Oregon joined us. They were on a 14-day tour of the Maritimes. We compared notes, laughed, and enjoyed a light dinner, and endured a rather loud and not very good guitarist. <laughs> Saturday, October 7th, St. Andrews to Exeter, New Hampshire, 324 miles. This was the last trip of our day, of our last of our trip. Today began a long drive back to the U.S. At the border we visited our first, and there are many, Tim Hortons. The retired Toronto Maple Leaf hockey player has built an empire of these donut shops which dot the eastern Canada's countryside. Like Denny's in the U.S., unfortunately this spot was full of tour buses. After a lengthy wait for muffins, we crossed at St. Stephen's and drove Highway 9 to Bangor. The red, yellows, and oranges attacked our eyes for the next 90 miles. We made one stop in Freeport, Maine, home of the L.L. Bean and 90 other outlet stores. The weather had cleared and thousands of folks flooded the streets and stores for their Saturday outing. We luckily found a parking place in an alley behind the Starbucks and joined the throngs. After an hour of walking and looking, we tried another lobster, lobster roll while sitting on a side porch and watching the crowds. One should be a serious shopper and love crowds to come here. We're neither. We stayed at the best Western Hearthstone in Exeter, primarily because of its access to Logan Airport, and uh, rather than going through the Boston proper. We woke up to clear skies and an icy windshield at 5 a.m. the next morning. The stars were incredible as we drove the empty freeway and followed a well-marked path to Logan. Impressions. The Maritimes are flat. <coughs> While the coastline is pretty, with one small fishing seaport village after another, Washingtonians and Oregonians may be a dis bit disappointed. Of course, the towns in this area have an additional hundred years of history to share with us, with, with, <coughs> its, with, us, with, with its visitors. That makes a big difference. The history of this area is memorable, and the stories of individuals, Alexander Graham Bell, Frederick Olmsted, Longfellow, Lucy Maud Montgomery, who helped shape it, are legion. Be mindful of driving distances and provide enough time to explore the nooks and crannies of the Atlantic Ocean <clears throat> and Bay of Fundy shorelines. If you enjoy the work of gleaning the meat from crab, you will like the lobster. The Bay of Fundy is an incredible body of water. This actually should have been two trips for us. New England is not the Maritimes. These are two distinct areas. While Maine was originally part of Acadia, it fits better with the New England trip. 
sites we especially enjoyed, Benefest, Maine, not for the beer fest, but for the unspoiled feeling. Campobella, New Brunswick, where the Roosevelt played in the summer. Charlottetown, where Canada began. Bedeck, Nova Scotia, and Alexander Bell's contributions here. Grand Prix, Nova Scotia, and the historical significance of Evangeline. Halifax, and Pier 21. Recommendations. <coughs> Study about the Acadians before you go and get a good understanding of the French, British, and American impact of this area. Be prepared for lots of tour buses. There are fewer in the fall and spring. Plan an itinerary for at least two weeks to enjoy the sites at a comfortable pace. Use Halifax, Sydney, or Wolfville as a home base for some of the more popular day trips. Fly directly there rather than driving from Portland or Boston. Pretend you are really a maritimer. One needs to remember this was seafaring country, <laughs> and that orientation and history make better sense if viewed from that perspective. Seek out the smaller, lesser known seaport towns. Bar Harbor, Kenny Bugport, etc., are extremely popular. One can get a better feeling of the original Acadia without the commercialization that is rampant in these locations. St. Martin's, New Brunswick, and Sherbrooke, Nova Scotia are two suggestions. Take some time on the Cabot Trail, bicycle on Prince Edward Island, walk the new Fundy Trail, avoid poutine, especially on water conveniences, and at least try the lobster rolls. That's it. Um, the lights aren't on, but uh, did you do that, Karen? Did you not do that? Turn them on. Well, yeah, if people have some comments or questions that they'd like to add. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I've been to the Maritimes, especially uh, coming out of Maine and such. But what I think is relevant to them and similar is Labrador, Newfoundland is just to the north and east. And I had the uh, opportunity to spend a week there teaching a class. Yeah, about 12, about 12 years ago, in other words, 24 years after you were in the area. One of the things you mentioned is that the easternmost point of the United States is in the Maritimes. The easternmost point of the continent of North America is in Newfoundland. And it's a short drive from St. John's, which is a natural harbor there. We had a young man take us on that short drive, and he was very interesting because his uncle had been a fisherman, but the cod industry and so forth had collapsed. So what was this young man doing? He was learning how to be a chef in a fancy restaurant. And where was the fancy restaurant chain? Why the oil people had moved in and were looking for oil in offshore. And so the whole business of St. John's in Oregon from fishing had moved towards oil. So and they brought in really good restaurants. We had wondered why there were so many good restaurants in town. And they were training the children of fishermen to basically become chefs of one kind or another. Thank you. Henry? I guess I have uh, two comments. What, one, uh, a maritime tour, totally ignored Newfoundland. <coughs> Newfoundland. Yes, you think that there? I mean, New, Newfoundland and, and Labrador would have been should have been included in the Maritimes. We didn't have the time to do that, so uh -huh. we picked some of the more populated areas. Yeah. And um, because uh, it's interesting, to, all, the only maritime I've ever been to is Newfoundland. It's sort of funny, but um, the other come did they talk about the? I think the biggest explosion that ever occurred in North America, yeah. other than nuclear occurred in 1917 in the harbor at Halifax. Totally leveled the town, many people killed. Trump, uh, aid overwhelmed hospitals, of course, and the aid was delayed because of the winter weather. I think it was in December. Yeah. And some aid came from the United States, but mostly from Canada. From, uh, and, and I would think that would be a big subject to be talked about in Halifax. Right. You know, right? It was in the I guess we didn't seek it out enough. If we, 
again, we, this was a, a rather whirlwind trip, as you can see. Yeah. And so, no, we didn't spend time learning enough about it, but thank you, Henry, for adding. What caused it? Yeah, back there. What was the cause of the explosion? Yeah. Two uh, ships collided. Two ships collided in the harbor. One was French, I think. Uh, uh, it had uh, lots of uh, explosive, uh, wartime uh, explosives heading for France for the war. Ah. World War I is what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, back in the 60s, I uh, spent a summer in eastern Maine and stuck across the border to Newfoundland. I was a young single guy and I loved square dancing, so I looked up a square dance and I got culture shock. The folks up there knew what to do by the music. There was no caller, so I was really lost. <laughs> <laughs> the band. Yeah. Yeah. How much French did you hear? I mean, that's all. Isn't that all French-speaking provinces? No. no. Not, not so much in the Maritimes, no. When you get to Quebec and Montreal, okay. then you hear more French. Okay. But not in that area. It was because it was such a British-occupied area, too. Okay. So the the French they, wanted the, they wanted to get rid of the French, the Acadians, so the British were the predominant force there. If you want French-speaking, go to Quebec. <laughs> you feel like you're in France. Yeah. One in the back. Oh, three. So I went to Quebec last week or two weeks ago, and there's plenty of French spoken, Judy. Um, it was great. I stayed in Chateau Frontenac for four nights with my sister and her husband, who were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. They'd gone there on their honeymoon, could only afford one night, but we're now up to four, so that was an improvement. The Cabot Trail is well worth the drive, and it's, it's really stunning. Um, little towns, uh, a lot of crafts in Canada, and you'll find them in a place like Cheetah Camp, where they have hooked rugs that are just stunning. I think I better stop. <laughs> yeah, the, the visiting the two cities of Montreal and Quebec, we've had a chance to do that. It, that's a pretty fascinating area. <clears throat> um, I, I, when I was in Halifax, we also visited a museum that uh, talked about the Titanic because they brought the uh, survivors back uh, to Halifax. Oh, that's right. That's that was right. very interesting. Yeah, Quebec reminds me, uh, we were coming back from a Navy training cruise from uh, Norfolk, Virginia to Seattle. For some reason, we thought it'd be fun to drive up through Canada. And one of my colleagues really, really wanted a French atmosphere at a restaurant. And he was disappointed. It was sort of like a Denny's or something like that. But everything was in French and we weren't very lingual. So if it had been any more French, we'd have never gotten anything to eat. <laughs> One more here. Two more. What's the biggest industry in uh, the Maritimes other than tourism? Um, the biggest industry in the Maritimes, I don't think we found one besides tourism. We weren't looking, you know, we were looking to find that out. Shipping, I imagine, uh, servicing ships because of the, the ocean. But I, I don't know of any, I can't speak to that. Fishing, of course. Timber, I don't know about timber so much. Um, they didn't, you didn't feel the, the sort of forest we'd have in the Northwest. I didn't feel that at all. Um, another couple and I and my husband went uh, to just Cape Breton because we wanted the music and the cavies. You know, those are the, you walk into a pub or a bar or, and there are people just jamming. And, and, uh, Celtic type music, and it was just fabulous. And you're right about the Cabot Trail. If you go anywhere, go to the Cabot Trail. Hi, I'm Maggie Dillon. I'm Karen Place's sister. I just wanted to let you know Karen got called back to the apartment 
So she says, excuse her, and um, she'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you. Well, if there are no others, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,